Hi, and welcome to the podcast. Today we talk with Elias Parent. As you'll see, he's very passionate about this topic. I also have to admit that this podcast was technically our test podcast and that this young man is actually my son. Initially, this wasn't supposed to show up on the podcast list, but we had a really good time talking about this topic and I believe you'll enjoy it. What was really incredible is that he had no notes or papers in front of him. I don't know how he does it. In this podcast, I talk to academics, students, amateurs, scholars, and young people. You may have noticed, not all the topics here are Canadian, but I am. I'm Rosie, and this is my podcast. I guess it's time for some World War history, eh? So today we're talking with Elias. He is a young man who's very passionate about anything World War and particularly tanks and other subjects, which hopefully we can chat about later. If we want to start talking about tanks and we're looking at the history of tanks, we have to mention Leonardo da Vinci because what history doesn't start with Leonardo da Vinci? In 1487, he designed a vehicle and some people actually say was a prototype to modern tanks. It had two large inside cranks that could be powered by four men and there were cannons and even steel enforced falls to help deflect enemy fire. That's a pretty cool prototype and I mean da Vinci was pretty cool all around. If we jump ahead to 1912, Lancelot the Mole is actually credited with developing the idea of a tank and he tried to approach the British authorities with his idea but there was nothing that came out of it necessarily. If we jump ahead a little more, the first official tank was Little Willie. Now, Elias, do you know what it was? Had you heard about Little Willie before? Little Willie was a universal carrier. It never saw combat. It couldn't even cross German trenches, but they tested it to try to see if they could make a vehicle that could not get bogged down by mud and if they used the prototype wheel system that would be a lot of wheels instead of just four on a vehicle. That would push a metal bed or small metal track links and the, it was basically the first prototype tank that was not used in combat to test the track system and they didn't really use it because as you said they wanted to cross trenches or go through mud but it was slow it used to overheat and it didn't really cross the trenches so what did they do did they scrap that project start a new one did they just make little upgrades after Little Willy, they saw the downsides of it and they made a second prototype for Big Willy and they fixed the problems with it, made it so it could cross German trenches easier, but it never did. Even though both of these tanks never saw combat, we're talking about them because of what? Did they actually change anything in tank design or in tank evolution? By that time, tanks weren't even a thing. Like the word tank wasn't even invented. They didn't think of that yet. They were basically just testing out a new track and suspension system to see if it would be able to go through mud easier. And if they could put a gun on it, then it's basically a rolling bunker. I see. If we look at history during World War One, so in September 1916, the British forces actually were able to attack the Germans using tanks. That was during the Battle of La Somme. La Somme. And can you talk about that a little bit too? What happened? During that Battle of La Somme, the British already evolved because it's been a year or two after Little Willy and Big Lily, and they developed a tank called the Mark I, and with that, it was a longer tank where the tracks would go all around the body of the tank, and the center part had a big engine and six plus crew, and it had two guns on the side, no turrets. It was two gun emplacements on the side, six pounders, small guns, but big for the time, and they could really do some work. They started off with that tank, as you say, and I guess during World War One, there must have been some evolutions that were happening. The Renault FT-17 was revolutionary because 
the turret design on it, the 360 traversing turret, was a revolutionary design. And if you could move the gun all around, you wouldn't have people flanking you or trying to get on your side if the gun could point on the side. And you would also not have to stick 12 guns around the tank to make sure that all the sides are covered. And nobody could really sneak up on you, I guess, at that point. And if you got 10 tanks with turrets, then nobody could really sneak up on you, no? There's a lot of different changes through tank design in World War One, but it seems that the bigger changes happened a little further down the line. So if we talk about tank design, there's different iterations, and then we can kind of jump ahead to World War Two. So in World War Two, what were some of the changes that happened? Well, in the 1930s, there were a lot of tank competitions to make sure that companies wanted deals with tanks. So they did little competitions like which one would be best. But uh, during World War II, pretty much every tank that was there, except for the tank destroyer classes, which didn't have a turret, but all the other tanks, medium, heavy, light, and some of the tank destroyers in the American line had turrets on them. They all had turrets. So all the tanks in World War II essentially had turrets mm -hmm. because of that FT-17 yeah. design. So the tanks that were designed for World War II, did they have different capacities? World War tanks seem to have trouble even going through trenches. Did they have that problem with World War II tank designs? Did they improve on that aspect too? Different landscapes or whatnot? Well, the British forwarded the evolution when it comes to the Mark I to Mark X tanks. They started making the Churchill line of tanks. Mm -hmm. And those tanks were basically made for crossing trenches. But what they didn't know is that World War II wouldn't be like World War I. Trenches wouldn't mm -hmm. be as massively used because tanks were the big thing in World War II. Same for trenches were basically obsolete, at least full-on trench warfare. They were still using trenches because it's better to have cover, but tanks would be able to roll over the trenches pretty easily. And they wouldn't have huge trench systems and the battlefield wouldn't be as muddy because they wouldn't stay in one place for too long. So because of all the movement, they had different landscapes to consider. And sometimes the tanks weren't necessary in some of the parts. Yes, like in Italy with the mountains, there were some tanks there, but it was pretty hard to move a tank up a mountain to the side and usually being attacked by ambush was a big thing. So you don't want to just send 10 tanks out there and not be sure if they're going to come back or not because of the terrain. And, um, and then people think that tanks are completely indestructible or they're so hard, the armor is very serious. You know, there's some myths possibly in there. Do you know if uh, <laughs> you have ideas on some of these myths that they're indestructible or not? Yeah. So the quality of the German tanks were really, really good. And, well, everything but the transmissions, at least, because they use older transmissions on heavier tanks. So what made them not indestructible? When the Americans landed on the beaches in France, they realized that their tanks needed an upgrade because the German tanks had heavy armor and they were thought to be indestructible. But when the Americans started putting the 76 millimeter gun on their Shermans, they started to be able to go through the front armor, the Tigers and the Panther tanks. And if they hit it from the side, then the tank would be over. And when it comes to infantry, the rocket launchers like the bazooka and the smaller rocket propelled or springs from the British army that they used in the infantry divisions, they could still go through the tanks, even if they were bad or good. And the Germans had a lot of rocket launchers or self-propelled of their own, like the Panzerfaust and the Panzerschreck. And those would be used to fight tanks. And the Panzerfaust was mass produced everywhere. There was crates of them. They were really dispensable. You just shoot the warhead and then drop it and run. If the tanks were not indestructible, did they have a specific area? Did every tank have a weak spot, so to speak? So there were a lot of classes of tanks and uh, in instance, there were tank destroyers, which some of them didn't have turrets, mostly in the other countries' lines, but in the American lines. They used turrets in a couple of them, like the Hellcat and also the M36 Jax and the M10 Wolverine. They used turrets, but in some of them, like the T95 Doom Turtle and the T28, they, they didn't go for the turrets idea. Because if it's made to kill a tank, you're going to stay in the back with a big gun with a lot of armor or with light armor. And you're just going to stay hidden and shoot the tanks when you see them, try to ambush them. You're not going to need too much armor in certain cases or in certain other cases, you're going to be in city streets and you're going to need a lot of armor because rocket launchers and people coming in. So sometimes you did need a lighter tank and sometimes you needed a heavier tank, just depended on what kind of battle you were fighting or what kind of yeah. location it was. Yeah, unlike these days, during World War II, there were light, medium, heavy, and tank destroyers classes of tanks. Nowadays, it's just the main battle tank to fight. Because it's a different type of fighting. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine tanks are really heavy. Even the lighter tanks are probably very heavy. Were people able to airdrop them, so to speak? There were some tanks that were airdroppable. Really? <laughs> like the uh, 
M22 Lucas and also the Tetrarch from the British line and the M22 is from the American line and they were airdroppable. They were only eight tons or slightly more. Oh, that's it. More. That's only a few elephants, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Three people would be in them, sometimes two. You could work with two mm -hmm. and they would drop them on the battlefield in the, with a parachute off a plane and then the infantry and the, they would bring the tank crewmen up to the airdrop point and when the tank landed they would hop in and start the engine and bring it back and it would be in the front line kind of they wouldn't drop it in the front line because that'd be pretty risky but yeah yeah so if they did air dropping which is really interesting by the way how else did they transport the tanks around tanks that were not air droppable they mm -hmm. used boats for the on the american side and the british side because they were across the, the ocean, ocean yeah. so they couldn't really use trains but the russians used a lot of trains same for the germans Italy. Japan was kind of on their own islands, but don't know too much about the Japanese during World War II when it comes to tanks. But the Germans and the Russians used trains, and that's why they attacked train tracks. Bombers bombed train tracks because if a train with 300 tanks on it can't get to the front line, then that's 300 tanks less to fight for another day. They would load them on the carts of the trains, okay. and then they would hook them up with chains to make sure they don't fall off, and the train would drive it near the front line, maybe like a, a city near the front line, and the crew would be there, and they ready would hop in and off. gas up the tanks, mm -hmm. arm it, and do missions, and get ready to go in the front line. So they had many different ways of delivering the tanks, so to speak, depending on location and ocean separating countries yeah. and such. I mean, the airdroppable tanks, they weren't flown across the ocean there but uh, when the americans landed they had some ideas and they dropped them closer it's easier to go by plane than by a train because the plane is faster and doesn't have trees to go between and mountains to go between and they wouldn't be able to drop the better tanks they would only be able to drop very very light and small tanks like i'm talking about the m22 being maybe four to five feet tall or when you would be taller than the tank itself they wouldn't be dropping a Sherman down there. The Sherman's too heavy, same for the Russians. They wouldn't be dropping T-34s down. They would just be dropping the smaller tanks. Much lighter tanks. Yeah. And so talking about tanks and warfare, what kind of strategies did each country go by? So some of them like to airdrop or ship with trains, but when it comes to the actual strategy of using tanks during warfare, what were some of the things that they did? Well, the Germans used the Blitzkrieg strategy at first um, to invade Poland and go all the way into France and capture it. But after that, they couldn't really use Blitzkrieg on the British since there was English Channel blocking that in the way. And mm -hmm. they had to get air superiority and that's the Battle of Britain and we won't get into that. But the Germans used certain tactics and when it comes to tank developing, mm -hmm. like the production of tanks, the British, Russians and most of the Allies used quantity over quality, making a lot of tanks that are not the best but do the work just as well as a tank that is really good and bring them in the battlefield because the Russians, some of their tanks had gaps in the armor and someone can stick a grenade in there and blow up the tank. But they would bring them back into the shop and the people would scream at them saying, no, get that tank out of the shop. It goes straight to the front line. I don't care if there's a three inch gap. Hopefully nobody gets close enough to throw a grenade yeah. in there, essentially. Basically, the Russians went with dump as many tanks in the battlefield as you can. And it did work. They and were able to get the upper mass hand. Mass production, yeah. By, by doing that. Mm -hmm. Because if a German tank sees 20 tanks going towards it, Very true. it's scarier than the Russians going 20 tanks going towards one German tank. So even if this German tank has a stronger armament or is better built, so to speak, having 20 tanks shoot at it or attack it, I would imagine it doesn't really matter how well it's built. A tank is not indestructible, as you've said. A perfect example would be Battle of Kursk, Russians versus the Germans, when the Russians were starting to push back the Germans after Stalingrad. And it was actually known as the biggest tank battle in history. And the Russians used a lot of their tanks and the Germans they were kilometers away and the Germans could easily hit them well rather relatively easily, easily. relatively yeah. easily hit them with their 88 millimeter guns on the Tigers and the Panther tanks had a 75 high velocity and those could go three kilometers away snipe and the Russian tanks couldn't really do anything they just had to get up close two kilometers max and they did they they beat the Germans at the Battle of Kursk after a lot of tanks lost so they did lose a lot of tanks but they were still able by sheer numbers in sheer force to push back mm -hmm. and win that battle. The Russians eventually got close enough with all their tanks. The <laughs> Germans couldn't really shoot at all the tanks at one time. And uh, the Russians pushed them and Were able beat to the Germans. Them. And that helped the war, mm -hmm. undoubtedly. It was one of the bigger turning points when it comes to the Russian front line against Germany. 
And when it comes to, you know, you talk about turrets and the guns, do you know a little bit about the different kinds of guns they use for different purposes Mm -hmm. during, let's say, World War II? I know that's kind of your fascinating point with tanks. Another line of tanks that I didn't really talk about were self-propelled artillery, SPA, was basically a tank that would have a gun, an artillery piece on the tank. Mm -hmm. And they would move around, not on the front line, but behind the front line. And it was an artillery that could move around on a tank chassis, basically. And that was one of the classes. They used big guns with long-ish reloads. And longer ranges. They would shoot almost straight up near 45 degree angle. Mm -hmm. They could go really far away, five kilometers plus. And still hit targets. Yeah, accurately. But there would need to be a radio man on the front yeah, line calling it in, of yes. course. So they had different artilleries on each tank. Was it different countries had different philosophies when it came to artillery or different guns? When it came to artillery, of course, every country had different guns because <laughs> different companies produce different guns, but okay. the guns were usually 100 millimeter guns or bigger. Some tanks went up to 155 millimeter guns. Okay. And that would be the artillery class. Mm-hmm. In other sense, there were also the, I think, uh, bunker breakers they were basic tanks with humongous guns on them like fv 4005 i think and that tank had an 184 millimeter gun it was that would blow up a house essentially it would is basically you, yeah. if there was a bunker the after it saw the bunker the gone. bunker wouldn't be there the germans had pretty big guns when it came to that like the sturm tiger mm-hmm. had a i think it was a 350 millimeter gun mm-hmm. but it wouldn't shoot projectiles a human could also fit in the barrel there were wow. pictures where there was a german crewman sticking out of the barrel the barrel's very short maybe like half a meter and they were like posing for a picture there in the barrel it's pretty funny almost like a cannon during a circus act it was basically as wide as a cannon and it wouldn't actually shoot a bullet because you need a cannon you need a longer barrel too and that wouldn't be too good i'm getting ahead of myself there but they would use a crane on the back of the tank there was a little crane that's how they would bring the bullets into the tank to load it because the shells would be so big and the shells wouldn't even be bullets they would be rockets basically yeah, if yeah. there was a bunker there that was would, also destroyed <laughs> it would destroy the bunker and also the bunker beside it yeah. and maybe the one after that so it did have a, a wider range across mm-hmm. because it was more like a rocket than an actual and if that thing saw a tank and it hit the tank the tank wouldn't would have be destruction there. It wouldn't be there. Yeah. <laughs> Even the more modern tanks these days, the explosion would just be too big. So if it had such a big barrel at the front, was it slower? Was it a, a bigger, heavier built tank? The tank was very weak when it came to armor. I mean, the front armor was good. Mm-hmm. Against Sherman 76s, the front armor was pretty much useless. And infantry could easily throw a grenade in the barrel or True. open yeah. the hatch and jump on it. And it was mostly used for its actual purpose, destroying buildings and... Mm-hmm. So not necessarily fighting no, it uh, it w- one-on-one combat with another tank or no. with a front line. I don't think it ever happened in history where a Sturm Tiger shot a tank with its main cannon. It wouldn't make sense because it would probably get destroyed before, before. even shooting yes. it. I understand. Yeah. And during World War II, were there any cool stories that you found with tanks? Just in general, it could be on either side of the Axis or the Allies. Was there anything interesting that you found? I know that the Guinness World Record for biggest tank jump was done by a Russian tank in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Um, It is either a BT-5 or a BT-7. They look very similar, so it's Mm -hmm. hard for me to know it's old information. But it is still standing and holding the record for the longest tank jump. And And what does that mean, the tank jump? Meaning like over a cliff? over a. The tank basically went as fast as it could hit a jump and stayed in the air for as long as I could, (laughs) hitting the water after. And the crew in it survived and the tank was pulled out of the water. Oh, wow. (laughs) So it didn't destroy the tank? No. No. And so tanks could go in water, I'm guessing, since they had some armament on the bottom and they had tracks. But did they get stuck a lot? Did they have a harder time with some bodies of water? I'm guessing over their heads would not work there. It's not a submarine. Well, yeah, it's not a submarine, <laughs> but some tanks could go in the water up to the engine, pretty much to the exhaust. And where was the engine and the exhaust? Was it higher it up or lower? It was in the lower? back of the tank, and some tanks used a snorkel. They basically got a snorkel attachment for mm-hmm. the exhaust so the engine wouldn't flood. Yes. You could bring it higher above the tank, and you could drive almost completely in the water if you sealed off the cupolas and everything Mm -hmm. but uh, most of the tanks didn't want to go in the water because there were bridges and they would just build a there were specialized boats too to act like a bridge all connecting with each other and to help tanks across or help infantrymen across and and tanks mostly tanks because infantry had boats right that's true they could use little uh, kayaks or canoes (laughs) and go across the river but uh De- depending how much artillery they're bringing with them I yeah imagine. yeah <laughs> tanks they would need 
the they would need to ask politely to the combat engineers to build them a bridge. So they had so specialty they boats that helped traverse because bridges across... were a big target during World War Two. Okay. So artillery were aiming at least the Germans when they were being pushed back. They would try to blow up as many bridges as possible in the way because it's a key point, right? Mm -hmm. It's a choke point. So if you blow up the bridge, then they have to build one, and that takes longer. It delays yes. the attack. Or they have to find another way across, mm -hmm. and then the Germans could have found some way to blockade that or blow up the next bridge or yeah. whatnot, right? Yeah. But, okay. but now we're getting ahead of ourselves. <laughs> well, that's okay. Um, it's pretty fascinating because often we see tanks as just being a big, slow-moving vehicle that doesn't have a lot of purpose. And in the more modern wars, we just see them as something to keep the men safe, really. I know we're, we don't want to talk too much about the airplanes, but... The planes were definitely a thing in World War II, and they were a huge thing, a huge part of the war. So how did tanks work with airplanes or maybe prevent themselves from being blown up by airplanes? Well, if we fast forward to modern days, mm -hmm. for example, the M1 Abrams on the turret front, you see these little two plates on the cheeks of the turret beside the main gun. Mm -hmm. And they're little squares with X's on them, and you're like, what is that? But I mm -hmm. read about that because I was confused and it's actually nowadays we see tanks through the sights if mm -hmm. you're in an enemy tank or if you're in a tank shooting at another tank you'll see the heat signature so the tank's going to pop up right in the sight you know you're like looking it, through a heat like detection an infrared yeah. yeah infrared that's what they use mm -hmm. basically on the m1 abrams on the cheeks of the turret those things are two plates and they they stay cold they're not like fully attached to the mm -hmm. tank so on the infrared they're seen as two very very easily seen dark patches on the red visor and planes distinct that if they see that they know that it's an m1 abrams and it's oh. friendly <laughs> i see so I that's see. one of the detection things that planes would use on tanks mm -hmm. more modernly so mm -hmm. in world war ii did they work together more in world war ii there were a lot of accidents on friendly fire when it came yeah. to planes and tanks most of the time they knew which tanks were which and they had information on what tanks were where they okay. they were informed on friendly tanks would be here in the, the locations the enemy force would be over there mm -hmm. so don't fire on that yeah, side don't of the fire fence on that if you side will. Of yeah. the fence. okay they were able to work together mm -hmm. okay and then for infantrymen did they have different strategies to work with the tanks mm -hmm. now we're going to tactics again yeah. and the germans use blitzkrieg basically bringing the tanks first and demolishing everything in the path and then the infantry cleaning up after them but then it got mm -hmm. too far and you can see at Dunkirk the German tanks had to stop because the infantry had to catch up and the supply line was getting way too slim. And, and then on the British or American or Russian side, did they have tactics also to work with the infantrymen? On the British side, they made their tanks not to be too fast. Like if you look at the Churchill tanks or the Matilda, mostly those, they were there to support the infantry. They, okay. were, they weren't there to work alone. They either. couldn't go fast. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. They couldn't go um, 50 kilometers an hour, mm -hmm. or 30 kilometers an hour. The transmissions and engines were made to be limited to 20 kilometers an hour max to make sure that the infantry would be able to stick with them and mm -hmm. the tanks in fear retreating or something. They wouldn't just speed off and leave the infantry behind. Mm -hmm. So then the infantrymen were safe or were you know guarded, if, if you will, by mm -hmm. some of these tanks. And they were able to run a alongside them or behind them. They're mm -hmm. not miles and miles or kilometers away. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they did have tactics then on either side of how they were using the tanks. And they're not necessarily the same tactics. The Americans, their tanks could go fast. But mostly the Shermans was the big tank of World War II for, on the American side. But mm -hmm. when it came to France, they wouldn't really push too fast anyways. So they didn't, didn't have the chance to just leave the infantry behind and the tanks go forward. Mm -hmm. Because there was a lot of land, but it wasn't Russia, Germany lands. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that fast. Okay. So there was still a lot of movement in the war trying to figure out what was going on. And they had to kind of adapt to all the situations. Mm -hmm. Did they ever make a tank that floats? <laughs> yes. Really? Okay. <laughs> the, the Russians, well, they have the BMP line, which they are tanks that can float on water amphibiously. And also the Sherman had a package for it. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be able to use the gun or anything, but they used it on D-Day and Zia. It was basically like a little wrapper around the tank. It was like a little boat. But oh, so it's like a little mm -hmm. boat that you put under the tank. During 
D-Day, there was this, I read about this, and mm -hmm. on Omaha Beach, a lot of the Shermans <laughs> sunk because the waves were just too big because of and the bad weather. Get, yeah. And only one tank made it on the beach. Oh, wow. Only, okay. yeah, out of all the tanks, only one actually made it on the beach. And so survived. they decided to change that and to add packages the, where they can float a little Well, no, bit. that was with the packages. Oh, that's with the packages. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay. It wasn't... So it wasn't very efficient then. No. <laughs> it worked for rivers and, you know, going across yeah. stuff that didn't have bridges, but for big waves... But the Russians, their tanks didn't have packages. The chassis itself was made mm -hmm. to be able to float on water. And the Americans also made a tank, the LVT. It could float on water. It was propelled by the tracks and two small propellers in the back. Was it easy to direct? I imagine it wouldn't be no, very easy. No, well, you yet, could right? make one of the tracks stop and the right track continue okay. and it would be able to turn yes. and stuff. But it wasn't, but it wasn't a speed boat or, <laughs> yeah. or a dinghy. It wasn't or a very, very efficient no, 10 speed 10 kilometers boat. an hour yeah. plus. But it did prevent them from getting waterlogged mm -hmm. or, as you said, you know, crossing rivers that maybe don't have a bridge. Even those tanks aren't submarines. They can't go fully underwater, but if they fall in a river or something, back, a little better. and they fall mm -hmm. the right side up then <laughs> okay yeah. as long as they don't fall upside down yeah. or on the wrong side yeah. i see i see yeah you they never will know. float and back to i guess we're talking about a tank that has sort of a neat feature did some of the tanks I, i'm kind of almost imagining this lego style where you have a tank that's like the lego and then you can kind of change these little items around it did they have things that they would change around um meaning let's say i, I really don't know much about tanks but let's say you have the turret and then you have a front piece you can add on or you can change for different circumstances and like a little lego tank yeah. and you keep adding little elements to it is that an idea so if that you think had? about the <laughs> the lego thing that you talked about um, yeah. a lot of russian tanks basically did that let's say the t72 which was mass produced and sold everywhere in the world and still being used by a lot of third world countries mm -hmm. the russians to make it better they just plopped a bunch of er well the soviets at the time at the time to make yeah. it better they plopped around era on it explosive reactor active armor they were basically little tiles if you see those little tile blocks on the tanks on the front mm -hmm. sides roof back mm -hmm. everywhere if a bullet would hit it a chemical bullet not a kinetic kinetic would be a bullet with tungsten or iron or depleted uranium mm -hmm. a chemical would be well a chemical like a mustard gas or no, something a chemical using... meaning like a heat like oh, to heat. melt the armor oh, into splatter shrapnel on the other side of the armor to, to kill the people mm -hmm. inside yeah okay so chemical rounds ERA would block chemical rounds up to 300 millimeters sometimes mm -hmm. and sometimes the area depending on the evolution of it and the years sometimes they would only block 50 millimeters of, of chemical impact and there were basically little tiles that you could put on the tank to make it better and you can see that in the russian side and also in the american side with the bradley ifv infantry fighting vehicle they put era on the sides of it to make it urban package to, to make sure that rocket launcher is like an rpg7 because those use chemical chemical warheads bullets. Okay. on the rockets it would just hit it and the explosive reactive armor would block it and the tiles would blow up of course because it's explosive reactive armor mm -hmm. so they've modernized some of these tanks by retrofitting if you will kind mm -hmm. of like my little lego yeah. these tanks to work better in more modern warfare and there's a lot of different armor design they go from world war ii where they used roll homogenous armor mm -hmm. and a teeny bit of spaced armor spaced armor is where there's one plate of armor and then air and then another plate of armor because is that for heat or cold no that's no. just for kinetic and also it, it counts as a universal it's really smart because if the bullet or the tank round hits the first plate of armor mm -hmm. then the shrapnel it shrapnelizes right it breaks into pieces after mm -hmm. it goes in the armor and then there's air so it gets to spread apart and shrapnelize and then when it hits the other plate of armor it's just a bunch of little pieces of metal hitting the other plate and it they're not stops as, it yeah they're, it's not like a bullet hitting on mm -hmm. the other side or on the inside and if you have six layers of that so then no bullets are going to go through and it's really smart so instead of having sort of a heavier, more, let's say a heavy metal or thick metal armament, then you have these little layers, little pockets of air where the shrapnel can kind of keep spreading before it even gets inside. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what you're yeah. talking. This and that was, would be during World War II? Late World War II, okay. early Cold War. After that, they used steel with um, ceramic and different layers. Did they try liquids or anything like that? I'm sure there must no. have been some different engineering. I'm, yeah, I'm sure, but I'm not too specialized Your specialty in that. is more the, the World yeah, Wars. Yeah, I know that's 
the British revolutionized armor a teeny bit. When it comes to the Chieftain Mark X, it had, I forgot the name of the armor, it's, it's a weird name, but on the turrets, the armor, they used a bunch of little elements. Oh, they really? were able to make an armor with layers. There was like a layer of metal of world homogenous. Of a specific a metal, layer then of another. Ceramic, and then a layer of this, and then another layer of metal, and then air. And that was to prevent very specific mm-hmm. types of attacks. Mm-hmm. It would mostly prevent, it would prevent pretty much every attack when it comes to, let's say a tank shoots the turret, it would prevent the kinetic and chemical attack from the shells. Depending so was on. protecting the turret really important when you armed your tank? Well, protecting the turret itself, I'm mm-hmm. talking about the turret cheek, so like the armor on the side of the yeah, gun. The turret, and yeah. if a To protect hits, the people. Yeah, to protect the mm-hmm. crew members inside. Same for the driver. But most of the time they would try to stay hold down, mm-hmm. meaning the turret would only stick up over the hill. Not. Okay. When you're talking about a tank too, what was sort of the typical tank crew? I mean, depending on the country, I know that the tank crews can change a little bit, but how many people generally would have to run the tank? Where were the positions inside of a tank? During World War One, they had like 18 crew members, oh, but really? that was because they had a bunch of guns everywhere and they didn't know oh, I see. the turret idea. Mm-hmm. But in World War Two, it was mostly these five crew members. It was gunner, loader, driver, commander, mm-hmm. and machine gunner. And what was the difference between the machine gunner and the gunner? The gunner would aim the main gun, and the machine gunner was usually in the hull beside the driver, aiming the gun attached to the hull. That was on the, like, M4 Sherman, for example. Mm -hmm. The loader would load the gun, the commander would Mm -hmm. be in the cupola and command everybody, Uh and uh, the gunner would aim the gun and listen to the So there was more than one gun on the tanks, often. Well, there was one main gun, like the big cannon. Where the turret is. Where the turret is, there was a cannon. That's the one we see on every Mm -hmm. tank. And then I guess they had little smaller guns around yes. sometimes. For example, on the Sherman, they had the big 76 millimeter gun, but beside it to the left, they actually had a, I'm pretty sure it's the left at least, mm-hmm. they had a machine gun attached to the turret because if there's infantry, you can aim the gun at the trench and mm-hmm. then machine gun them. And also in the hull of the machine gunner, where he would sit on the right side of the tank, there was another machine gun there that they could use and traverse in a ball turret mount mm-hmm. and they could shoot at people through the slips and make sure that infantries can't just run up to the tank and yeah, you're not going to use your surprise. main gun on one person <laughs> did they have many instances of people surprising the tanks the americans during world war ii they would really try to keep infantry around because okay. if there's people around the tank then they can keep an eye out they can keep an eye out yeah mm-hmm. a good movie demonstration of this example is during the movie fury Mm -hmm. The tanks go through a slim column of trees and there's four tanks and the protagonists are in the second tank Mm -hmm. and there are a bunch of Shermans. The first tank gets shot by a rocket launcher, the Panzerfaust, and Mm -hmm. by Hitler Youth Mm -hmm. and it blows up because there's no infantry around. Those are the last tanks left. Okay. That could explain actually why some of the countries use the strategy of having a slower tank, keeping the infantrymen around them. And it's not just to protect the infantry, it was also to protect themselves Mm -hmm. is what you're saying. So, you know, preventing some surprise attacks or unexpected moments, if you will. And I mean, some tank hatches could lock, but some of the time in battle, you wouldn't have the tank the hatch above you yeah. always locked. And mm-hmm. so an infantry, if there were no other infantry around, an enemy infantry could just jump on the tank and throw a grenade in the hatch and, and that was it. Hatch yeah. and all dead. So tanks, I would imagine, even during World War II, would have been fairly expensive. And as you said, they sometimes mass produce these tanks and. It took a lot of years to (laughs) to go through the developing of tanks. Yeah, the evolution of tanks where they keep adding. To develop the tanks, it took Mm -hmm. a couple years there. And to do any add-on, I would have to to get a bigger gun from the 75mm on the Sherman to the Mm 76mm. I don't know too much about this, but there was probably Mm -hmm. a little competition between which gun should we use. Like on the British tanks, the the Americans gave them Shermans and the British used the Mm 17-pounder on the Sherman Firefly to defeat the German tanks. That was the main thing that was before the Americans. The engineers essentially had to come up with what type of gun is really good for what type of tank. Some tanks are better suited for some guns. Like you wouldn't want to put the massive cannon on a tiny little light tank that's going to tip over the minute you put the cannon, right? And yeah. I'm imagining like a gun, the feedback or yeah, kickback, sorry. The recoil. The recoil. Yeah, I'm imagining that the recoil would have some effect on what kind of tank you can put Mm-hmm. What gun? What gun you can put on what tank? Yeah. Again, if you have a little 
tank in there. A light tank, you can't really put a 100 millimeter gun or a 75 millimeter gun on it because the turret just isn't big enough for the gun. You can't fit two people in the turret if the turret is a barrel. The heavy tanks had a big gun and big armor. They were really slow, but they were tough. The medium tanks were a jack of all traits. They had a decent gun, a gun that could go through pretty much anything but wouldn't overkill, and had good enough armor to deflect maybe um, RPGs. Mm -hmm. and maybe I could deflect light tanks and maybe medium tanks mm -hmm. and the light tanks would be scouts and they would more nimble do reconnaissance were very, they faster very nimble very fast yeah and then there were also tank destroyers which were either really fast with basically recon tanks scouts with a pretty big guns 90 millimeter cannons or they would be very very slow tanks like the t95 doom turtle after world war ii it would go maybe 13 kilometers an hour <laughs> maximum and it had a huge 120 millimeter cannon with way too much armor at the front, 300 millimeters of armor during 19, late 40s, early 50s. And that armor was just way too much. Nothing would go through it till they invented better rounds for mm -hmm. more modern tanks. And do you have a favorite tank? I think my favorite. All around favorite. All around like, favorite yes. tank. Um, this is a hard one because there's a lot of <laughs> good ones out there. Obviously. But I really like the. I would have to think about this, but uh, a tank that I really do like would be the Leopard tank. Mm -hmm. And why German is that? Leopard. What's the What's the main reason why you like it? Is it nice looking? The or? look of it is <laughs> yeah. pretty amazing, and during its time, it did really good. Mostly the Leopard A1 A1 was probably one of my favorite tanks. And if I think about it, maybe I can find a better one. But no, well, a lot let's say we take the Leopard A1A1. What is it about that tank that you really love? I love the overall look of it and it's not like it's a, a bad tank when it comes to performance during its time in 60s and 50s. It, it did do good and it's late war German so East German so influenced by America mm -hmm. but it still has that German style to it. And Which is well built as you've mentioned before. They did do a lot of quality builds mm -hmm. with some of the tanks. It doesn't have that World War II German style to it. The very boxy with a big gun. It has a modern German style to it which was a new thing in that time but is really good. Again Canada uses the leopard tanks. Oh, we do. Today. Okay, not so we that, do like not that exact one, but so we like that model. Ones. They use the later ones, the okay. leopard twos, a four, two a four, and mm -hmm. two a five, two a six. So it was it was developed by the Germans, even though it's called a leopard. Mm -hmm. Well, the yeah. leopard, the leopard is a German thing. Okay, nineteen late fifties, and it was a new tank design, and they tried it, and it really did work. Mm -hmm. They still use it. I'm pretty sure it was decommissioned in the 90s, but mm -hmm. they use the later models. So they mm -hmm. use the Leopard 2s instead of Leopard 1s, which are the ones that I'm talking about. And so that stands as your favorite. Yeah. And I mean, you're Canadian, so why not be proud of what we're using? Canadians right? did use that tank back in the day. Not anymore, I don't think. Oh, but back okay. in the day, they back did in use the day. it. <laughs> Nowadays, they use the better Leopards, but... Mm -hmm. Still calling it a Leopard. One of the other questions I have, where does the word tank even come from? Who decided to call this, you know, rolling machine that's better than a car and stronger than a car? Who decided that this is called a tank? Well, the British during World War One, I, I did some reading on this. I'm not specialized too much. Yes. I know that the British in World War One didn't want to call it a rolling bunker because if there were spies and they heard that it's self-explanatory, mm -hmm. people would know what it was. So the British said when it comes to the Mark One and the Little Willy and Big Willy, like a gas tank. So the British coined this word, it seems. Be interesting to look at the linguistics on, on that too at some point. In England, apparently, there's a tank museum in Bovington. It also has the world's best collection of tanks. Somewhere around 300 vehicles on display, going from Little Willie all the way to the modern UK Challenger 2. So yeah. <laughs> I would imagine that would be on your travel plan someday. Yeah, it's on my bucket list. It's on your it's bucket up there. list. <laughs> yeah. I haven't been there yet, and I really want to be there. Every few years, they do something called the Tank Fest, and mm -hmm. they bring all the oldest tanks and the newest tanks, the most modern tanks, and they drive them around the track. Do you get a chance to drive, or do you need no. to be a tank driver? No. You no, get to you, watch them drive. You get to watch them drive <laughs> okay. around. I think they have, mm -hmm. it's either a Mark One or a Mark Ten, but it's a British World War One tank. It is a real British tank and it is still running and it moves really slow like four plus kilometers an hour but it does work and it's really fascinating to see that working after a hundred years i wonder if it has war damage on it if it is oh the probably tank. yeah i think they painted over well it i'm now. sure they have have you actually had the chance to be near tang at all physically just you know looking at them online or reading yeah. about them in books yes here in my town there's a m4a276 sherman and i've been near it and i also went to the auto 
Ottawa War Museum where there were a couple tanks. By couple, I mean 30 plus. Oh, that's and nice. Yeah. I got to see all tanks from a bunch of other countries, Germany, Britain, Canada, even America, France, all, all the newest tanks and older ones from 1930 all the way to Cold War. And they were still bringing some in. There was a T-72 that was covered over by a tarp. I know it was a T-72 because my friend told me he saw it earlier and they were bringing it in. And I'm guessing it'll be on display as the museum keeps By the time this to... podcast yeah. is out, it's probably, <laughs> it's probably on display. display. They've taken off the tarp and dusted it off. And because we live in Ontario, I know Kingston is really huge with war memorabilia. And it's more like the War of 1812 from what we've seen. But are there museum things that you know about at all? Near the RMC, I saw two Sherman Jumbo 76s and one Leopard A1A1 from early Cold War. It was known as an MBT by then during the Cold War and mm-hmm. main battle tank. But it was um, was it used during World War, War Two or just the Cold no. War? No, it was built for <laughs> it the was, Cold War. It was not built during World War Two. It was okay. a very modern tank that could okay. shoot modern shells, and it's not as modern as the Abrams tank in the U.S. line mm-hmm. these days that they still use. But uh, it was. 1970s tank. It was pretty interesting to see it in the field. <laughs> yeah. So I would imagine at some point on your bucket list, you also have trying to ride in a tank with a proper mm. tank driver and get the feeling of what happens yeah. uh, in a tank. There are some companies that do that. That could be a good bucket list item. But they later. actually let you drive the tank. Like I know a, a YouTuber that drove an M4 Sherman mm-hmm. 76 in the bush. They were with a tank driver, an actual professional, Mm -hmm. but he learned him how to shift and how to throw the throttle and he drove it around for a long time. I'm guessing he was pretty excited. He was very excited. (laughs) (laughs) And I guess that's about it for my my questions. I mean, unless you had anything else you wanted to add. (laughs) (laughs) I think we've pretty much went over everything. Yeah, and you've mentioned everything you wanted to mention. Yeah. Yeah? (laughs) Well, if there are more questions or anything else somebody wants to know about, you can always send over the questions and hopefully uh, we can try to help you out in figuring out what the answers are. I'm very much not an expert. And Elias, as I said, is a young man and he's just very passionate about this. So he's not a, a historian by academic purposes but he definitely loves it i'm not a professional there when it comes to history in general idea i know quite a bit about tanks and and that's why we wanted to talk to you about it i know how passionate you are about everything in the world wars when it comes to artillery and varieties of uh, transportation so we can spark some interest again and maybe talk about airplanes next time if that's okay with you anyway (laughs) yeah maybe okay (laughs) perfect so thanks I really hope you enjoyed this not-supposed-to-happen episode with Elias. The book recommendations today are The Tank War by Mark Urban and Troop Leader by Bill Bellamy. There's also a really nice visual book by the Smithsonian called Tank, The Definitive Visual History of Armored Vehicles. Don't forget, you can find me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at History A. You can also go to the website. There's a link in the show notes. And if you can, I'd love to have a rating on your podcasting platform, such as iTunes. It really helps people find the podcast. And as usual, I'd like to thank Jamie, our brood of kids, including Elias, our family, our friends. Without them, I definitely wouldn't be adventuring through history. Un grand merci.